Anna gave her buddy Cheslin Marsh a ride back to his house on May 27, 2017, after spending the evening together. She was concerned that her friend, who was 22 years old, might be robbed if he skateboarded home by himself. She had no idea that the action she took to defend Cheslin would ultimately result in her losing her life in the most horrific manner possible. Welcome to Viral Crimes. Subscribe and hit the notification bell for more stories. On February 13, 1996, in Cape Town, South Africa, Hannah Cornelius was born to parents Willem and Anna Cornelius. She had a younger brother who was diagnosed with autism. Hannah pursued a Bachelor of Arts in Humanities degree at Stellenbosch University after completing her high school. During the period that they spent in college together, she and Cheslin developed a close friendship. In order to commemorate the completion of their second academic year at the university, the two friends went out for a few drinks on May 27. They had grown so preoccupied with their activities that they didn't pay attention to the time. After Hannah saw that it was already after 3 in the morning, she made the decision to call it a night and volunteered to take Cheslin home. She believed this would be much safer than allowing him to ride his skateboard on the dark and lonely streets alone. Hannah and Cheslin were unaware that there were four members of a gang roaming the area looking for trouble. When Hannah arrived to Cheslin's residence, they started chatting in the car outside. Cheslin moved to reach the backseat to get his skateboard as Hannah parked her blue Volkswagen Golf outside of his apartment building in Stellenbosch. As soon as he got back to the front, he shrieked in horror at what he saw there. Four males circled Hannah's parked vehicle in an aggressive manner, much like a predator circling their prey. The four men consisted of 33-year-old Vernon Whitby, 28-year-old Eben Niekirk, 27-year-old Geraldo Parsons, and 29-year-old Nashville Julius. They aggressively opened the car doors and seized the vehicle before Hannah had a chance to lock the doors. Hannah let out a piercing scream as she saw Nashville and Eben carry Cheslin to the trunk of the vehicle and threaten him with a knife. They placed him inside the trunk of the vehicle while Hannah and the other members of the gang sat in the front seat. Nashville eventually left after ensuring that both Hannah and Cheslin could not escape the vehicle. The other three gang members drove away from the parking lot at 3.40 in the morning as Hannah and Cheslin were kept captive inside the vehicle. Hannah was so afraid of the frightening screwdriver that was held so near to her neck that she remained silent the whole duration of the journey. The friends were driven around for hours by the robbers which, what had to be a hell ride for them. Security camera video revealed that the group had attempted to make a withdrawal from Cheslin's bank account at a gas station where they had stopped. However, he gave Vernon the wrong pin. The group traveled to Crawfontaine, a secluded part of Cape Town, after leaving the gas station. Cheslin was removed from the trunk of the vehicle by Vernon when Geraldo brought the vehicle to a halt. A punishment for giving them the wrong pin number for his bank card, Vernon yanked Cheslin out of the car and dragged him behind some bushes and kicked him viciously. Eben joined in on the assault while Geraldo restrained Hannah in the vehicle. Anna watched in shock as Vernon and Eben grabbed bricks and mercilessly beat Cheslin until his whole body was covered in blood. Cheslin soon lost consciousness as a result of the agony. After the brutal assault, they left Cheslin there to die. Absolutely terrified after what she just witnessed, Hannah pleaded with the attackers to spare her life. She cried and cried dreading what the attackers had planned for her. The men took turns sexually assaulting Hannah and also jointly assaulted her with Hannah screaming in pain. After the assault, they shoved her into the trunk of her vehicle and drove her to the closest vineyard they could find. Once they arrived, Geraldo attempted to pull Hannah out of the trunk of the vehicle, but she refused to come out. Eben's anger got the better of him, and he stabbed her in the neck. As blood started to pour, Geraldo released her from his grasp. When he saw Vernon pick up a rock that was two feet tall and move towards Hannah, he took a few steps backward. Geraldo made an attempt to stop the attack by saying, don't kill her, we've already killed Cheslin, let's leave her. On the other hand, Vernon paid him no attention and continued to throw the rock at Hannah's head. Because it was so forceful, the assault ended her life in an instant. They removed her body from the vehicle and dumped it on the other side of the vineyard before leaving. After killing Hannah, they continued their crime spree, attacking two ladies and robbing them of their money. Cheslin, meantime, had regained consciousness and was devastated by the traumatic experience of the violent assault. He appeared to be deaf in one of his ears. Cheslin was unwilling to give up for Hannah's sake, despite the serious damage that had been inflicted on his body. He was unable to go very far before stumbling over to a neighboring house and ringing the doorbell. 
when the homeowner observed Cheslin walking around with his clothing covered in blood, she quickly dialed 911 and requested an ambulance for him. Cheslin was transferred to the hospital after the police had questioned him and collected his statement. Thankfully he survived the brutal assault inflicted upon him, but Hannah, despite her best efforts, was unable to make it through her ordeal. The police examined the video from the surveillance cameras located outside of Cheslin's apartment as well as the gas station. It had caught Hannah's car plate number as well as the faces of the people who had committed the crime. The police were able to locate the vehicle, which was headed in the direction of Delft. Geraldo and Vernon had dropped Eben off at his house and then continued on their drive to Delft, where they planned to sell Hannah's vehicle. Geraldo and Vernon were apprehended by a Special Weapons and Tactics SWAT, unit because their gang posed an immediate danger to society. As soon as Geraldo saw that another vehicle was following him, he drove faster. However, his stolen car was unable to escape authorities, the authorities quickly closed in on them when they couldn't proceed any further due to a security gate blocking their path. They hopped out of the vehicle and were forced to try to escape authorities on foot. And as a result, both of them were caught and taken into custody by the cops. On the same day, law enforcement officials went to Eben and Nashville's residences and apprehended the two of them. At first, none of the four guys accepted responsibility for the crimes they had committed. However, Geraldo broke down in tears once the investigators showed him the semen stains that they discovered on Hannah's body and clothing. He admitted to everything except the murder of Hannah, which he accused Vernon of committing. The Cornelius family was left in shambles after learning of the death of their daughter. A year later, in March of 2018, Hannah's mother passed away after drowning while swimming close to Scarborough in Cape Town. Willem Cornelius, Hannah's dad said. I believe our family died with Hannah. Hannah's friend Cheslin was unable to complete his education as a result of the extreme anguish he had after losing his friend in such a horrific manner. In the end of November 2018, the criminal trial got underway at the Cape Town High Court. The judge ruled that Nashville's role in the crime facilitated the initial crime of carjacking and kidnapping of Hannah and Cheslin, despite the fact that the CCTV video evidence showing Nashville fleeing the scene after the four men carjacked the students. As a result, Nashville was given a sentence of 22 years, while the other three were given life sentences without the possibility of parole. Geraldo, Eben, and Vernon were determined to be responsible for the murder and rape of Hannah, as well as the attempted homicide of Cheslin and four counts of robbery. The guys did not seem to be remorseful when the court announced their sentences, rather, the guys made fun of their conviction by giving the judge the thumbs up as they were led away to jail, sneered in court, and one stuck out his tongue. Deslin was present for the sentencing. He had just lately been equipped with a hearing aid that recovered a significant portion of the hearing loss he sustained during the assault. Cheslin expressed relief, saying I'm just relieved that justice has been served. I can't describe how I feel, I am just happy. In addition to this, he disclosed that this was the first time he had interacted with Hannah's family and that they had spoken to him during the sentencing process. Hannah's father had assured him that he didn't need to worry about anything and that everything would be fine and he had urged him to get back to school in the coming year rather than letting what had happened deter him. Hannah was characterized as a daddy's girl and her devastated father Willem said that it had taken him some time to show up to the court hearing because he didn't want to hear what had happened to his beloved daughter. Even though Hannah's passing occurred years ago, her younger brother who has autism still asks his father when Hannah will come back from vacation. Willem's words, delivered in a mournful tone, were as follows. Me and my son are not a family, we are the survivors who live in the ruins of what once was. After Hannah's death, her parents went on to form the Hannah Cornelius Foundation to aid local children in pursuing an education and escaping neighborhood violence. Hannah, as described by her friend Tony, was never a typical child, teenager or adult. She was always unusually compassionate and empathic and deeply moved by the people she encountered, their stories and their struggles. The way in which she saw the world and wrestled with her place and purpose therein was paradoxically both mature and innocent. Hannah could be naively carefree and even careless at times. A dreamer. An idealist. Distracted and curious. But not many people saw her struggles and her personal suffering, which she carried bravely and faced fearlessly. Hannah loved completely. Firstly her parents and brother, but also friends and often even strangers. She suspended judgment and sought to know and understand. What happened to Hannah and her friend Cheslin was tragic. 
My condolences to Hannah's friends and family. After taking some much needed time away from school, Cheslin has returned to his studies with the help of generous donations and is now pursuing his law degree. May he continue to heal. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video.